Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard, and you're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. My guest today is Kia Baker. Kia is the creator and host of the Female Veterans Podcast, the founder of Artisma, an organization that advocates for female veterans, and is writing her first novel, a fiction based on true events. Welcome to the podcast, Kia. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored. Thank you. Yes. So um, why don't we start out by you telling us a little bit about you, like where did you grow up? Um, I know you've done lots of things in your life. You're a veteran and, you know, you're now you're doing podcasts. Why don't you tell us kind of where you started out so we can see your journey? Well, um, I was born in Philadelphia to a quite dysfunctional family and um, I was the, the child of divorce. And um, my mother, she entered a new relationship with a man who was mentally ill while she was struggling with mental health issues. So that made my childhood really um, unbalanced until about fourth grade when I was accepted into the Milton Hershey School, which is a private school in in central Pennsylvania. Um, They are... um, it was created by Milton Hershey, the chocolatier. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was an amazing experience. Um, there were tough moments, of course, but all, all in all, I was there for nine years and um, it probably saved my life. So um, I got a great education. And when it was time to figure out my next move in life, my mom, her dream had been to go into the military and um, she she had kids early in life. She had four of us. Well, she had three at the time. And when she was ready to go in, um, she was at the age limit, the oldest you could be to still be accepted. And she got pregnant, which ended her dream of a military career. But for me, gave me the best gift, which was my little brother. And um, so when it was time for me to choose colleges, which is what I wanted to do, she said, you know, we don't have a lot of income. This is going to be really, this would be hard for us. In fact, it would be impossible. So I want you to go to the military because number one, she wanted to do it and she didn't get to. Mm-hmm. And that way she can live vicariously through me. Mm-hmm. And number two, it would provide me college money so that I could go to school and which was my dream. And so it was important to her because she said it was the right foundation. This is the way you start your life. Serve your country and then go to school and then have a successful career. And it's what she wanted for me, so it's what I did. Wow. And so you went into the military, and what did you do in the military? Well, I was what's called a hospital corpsman. Some people will identify that better with a medic. Um, While I did that, I worked in the medical records office of the hospital for two years. And then they wanted me to see patients, like to train me like a physician assistant. And I was like, no, (laughs) that's not for me. (laughs) And so I actually really did well with pharmacology. So I went and worked in the pharmacy and my training was that of a pharmacist. I had the same privileges and capabilities and knowledge of a pharmacist. And that's what I did for the remainder of my career. And then um, I did three years in active reserve when I got out. Wow. And then how'd you go from active reserve to podcaster? <laughs> well, that, that's an incredible story. This is like my whole life story. Um, yeah, actually, after I got out of the military, I really struggled to adapt. And um, I thought I was going to leave the military world and just slay life. But then I realized my pharmacy experience was not going to be uh, valued the same on the outside of the military as in, and that I'd have to go to college in order to practice the way I had been. And I felt like that would be crazy for me to go to school and spend all that money to learn something I'd been doing for three years. So I decided to shift and go into corporate. And that was probably not my best um, 
choice because the corporate world then is not like it is now. There were no nap pods and yoga classes and riding around on scooters and stuff like that. <laughs> it was very different. And also I missed the camaraderie and the sense of family and just everyone spoke differently, behaved differently. It was just, it's a completely different world. And it was almost like a culture shock. So I really struggled for a while. And then about three years after I was out of the military, I found myself about to be home homeless and jobless. And my husband of five years had left me penniless. So I was in, I was in the lurch. <laughs> and um, fortunately, um, several women came to my aid and helped me in that time. And um, one of them was a veteran a friend and uh, another friend had got, just gotten a job at this great company. She said, there's a lot of veterans working here. You should come in and interview. And I went in and interviewed and I was able to have a really successful career and really work my way up the ladder there. And, um, and then I decided to have a family and became a stay home mom and started homeschooling my kids and, um, this whole time though, I would come across veterans who were in a struggle like I had been. And so I'd help them. Um, do you know how to file for disability? Do you know how to get your benefits? Do you, you know, are you taking your meds? Just even something that small to give back to someone in the veteran community. Because a lot of times a veteran, there's a stigma associated with um, seeking help especially in the military community and especially psych. And um, they'll talk to another veteran before they'll talk to a professional. And we just have a different understanding of each other and it's a different kinship. And um, so I did that. I did that just not as a volunteer or anything, just as part of my life for a very long time. And um, when my kids got old enough, they, my oldest is in middle school and he's homeschooled, um, but he's very self-sufficient. And my baby started preschool. So I was like, okay, I have time. What can I do? I need to um, start thinking about an encore career for myself, right? Give myself something to do. And I actually was interviewed by um, Kelly Hager from Eris. Um, that's erissisters.com. She's an incredible woman. She empowers women all over the country. And um, she wanted to share my story. And so uh, you can see that on her website. It's called the Kia Baker Story. And she was like, you know, um, let's meet up in Los Angeles. Angeles and let's make a strategy for your new career. And I was like, that's incredible. Thank you. Let's, let's go. I'd never been to LA. It was so exciting. And while we were there, we were talking about veterans and the help that I did with them. And she was like, you know, you're really passionate about veterans. Maybe you should do something with that. And I said, yeah, I am passionate about veterans. And I, you know, I started going on this soapbox about female veterans living on the streets and she's like let's go do something because that's how she is <laughs> and um I was like okay let's go let's go feed them and she's like I want to talk to them because she interviews people as well and so she she's like I want to talk to them and find out their stories and I was like let's go to the vet center and see if we can find some that we, we can talk to them and give them food and just have a day and so when we got to the vet center the outreach outreach coordinator she said you know it's really great that you want to give them food she's like but what they really need is a voice because due to the prevailing perception that veterans are men, they don't get donations. They don't get clothes or shoes or boots. She's like, you know what we have to do? Sometimes we get a blanket, a crochet blanket that some women donate at the hospital. She's like, we'll take that to them or they have to take what's left after the men. And so they don't have coats that fit them or boots. And it's, it's appalling. I, I left, I was, I was in tears. I just couldn't, I never even thought of it like that, like that the women wouldn't get donations, that they wouldn't have anything to give them. Mm -hmm. And that felt horrible to me as a woman and as a veteran. And I was determined at that point to do something to change that. And so that is, that is how this podcast was born because of Artemisia. Artemisia, the foundation was the first idea. And I was like, well, now I need to 
get the word out about that and start building that up. How am I going to do it? So I took um, a Speak to Inspire course at the London Real Academy because I saw Brian Rose on YouTube. He just came on. I was watching motivational videos <laughs> and he just came on and I saw it and I said, you know what? I'm going to take that course. I'm going to learn how to use my voice effectively to speak out for female veterans. And then I took that course. And at the end of that course, it was coming to an end. And I thought, man, this, this is great, but I need something more. And it was just at that time, I was actually watching the London reel on YouTube and his ad came on for broadcast yourself. And I said, I'm doing that. That's it. I'm going to make a podcast and I'm going to tell the stories of female veterans and I'm going to help them heal by sharing their stories. I'm going to empower them to speak out about the experiences and I'm going to help young girls who might be considering going into the military, see the good and the bad so they can make an educated decision before they go in. And that's, that's it. That's the story. And that is amazing. That is so, <laughs> so amazing because it's almost like they're they're you know they served and then they're forgotten. Mm -hmm. It's just you can't like it's hard. To, it's almost hard to believe that that could happen. That someone yeah. who has volunteered because we're not drafted anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So we volunteer to give up our human rights, and many people don't realize that when you sign up and you swear in, you become property of the United States government. You know, and it, for any person that is a minority or especially someone of color or a woman to become property is the ramifications of that is huge when you really think about it. And so we do that. We do that. We do that to protect and serve our country, you know, and to do, you know, we're at, we're at you know, the request of the president, what he wants done. And we have to follow those orders and do them regardless of how we might feel personally, you know, whatever conflict that could cause within yourself, you have to follow those orders and you do what you're told. And that's sometimes a really hard thing. Uh, it would be, it would be, <laughs> I can't imagine it actually. So, yeah. um, well, if there's some women veterans listening today and let's say they're in a spot where they're homeless or they're just not in a good space, maybe emotionally. Um, where do they go to get those services? How do they get help? What's their first step to go actually to the vet pull center. themselves out? Mm -hmm. go, mm -hmm. go, go to the local vet center. They're in, they're in almost every city, every major city. If they can get there, that's the first place. Any VA satellite, any VA hospital, just go there and, and that's where you start, you know, but that's a big thing for me too, because there isn't enough places for female veterans to go. Like there are no female only shelters, not really. Um, that's, that's new. That's something that's being done now. And so that's why Artemisia is important because it's going to change that as well. And actually I, I have now, um, begun working with another organization called Passageways in Kansas. And they, in five years, created a home for men that fully holistically rehabilitates them from the streets and gets them into life to thrive. I mean, into an apartment. They go through the, they live in the house and then they get everything they need, um, counseling, education, job help, like everything they need to get on their feet. Like sometimes they just, they don't have IDs. They don't have a social security card anymore. Everything gets taken from them living on the streets and they get everything back in order for them. And then once they're on their feet and they, the, the homeless veteran knows what they want to do, they help them move in that direction. And then they get them into their own apartment. Absolutely everything is donated, even to pictures on the wall food in the fridge. And now they're going to do that for women. So I'm joining forces with them to help out. And, and what's really amazing is that they have just been approved for 53 acres in Wichita to build an entire veteran community. And it's going to house homeless veteran men, women, families, and I get to go be a part of that and then help them spread that across the nation. And it's, I'm just over the moon about it because it's so needed. Yes, that is so exciting. And so they're just, they're building it now then. So it might it's just getting started to get it to go. Yeah. To get it together. But still that is awesome because when I, when I think about the number of people on the streets who are veterans 
and they're veterans because they serve their country and you know war is not beautiful they see things that are you know no human should see and and then we expect them to just come out and thrive after witnessing things like that that's true and and also it's important to note that there is no significant training to help them adjust back to civilian life. So we go through a TAPS program that's like maybe a week long, but boot camp is eight weeks. So in order to be indoctrinated into the culture and trained to be a soldier or airman or marine or sailor or coastie, you, you're trained for a significant period of time, but when you're released, you get a week. And then a lot of these people they have, like you said, experienced some type of trauma. It could be military sexual trauma. It could have been sexual harassment. Some of these women have had stalkers. Some of them just um, being in the environment of war and having rockets just dropping all around them and on high alert, but having to function normally as if that's not happening, that does something to you. So you come back with this trauma and maybe you can can't assimilate back into civilian life. I, I served during probably the last peacetime we'll ever see. Uh, and I still came out and struggled. So imagine someone who's seen their friends murdered, who, I mean, even I had a girl come on the show and she was like, I was a cook and I would serve food in the mess hall. And she was like, and every day I noticed that someone who had been coming through every day wasn't there anymore. And that hits you you know it does it affects you it changes you fundamentally internally (laughs) like psychologically that constant death and that constant like friends coming back disfigured Mm -hmm. all of those things that they have an impact on the the soldier or or the, the service member that it happens to but it also affects their friends because we're all like a family there going through that. So it's, it's, it has big implications as to how you're going to survive when you get back. And many, many, many of us struggle. It's, it's, that's what I learned over the years, helping mm-hmm. other veterans, that it, it is more common than not to get out and have a struggle, whether you're an officer or enlisted. Mm-hmm. Is there any um, strategies or tools you've used personally to help yourself? Let's say, um, you know, you can get in that place emotionally where it's just not a healthy place to be is there anything you've used meditation or anything like that I'm glad you asked that (laughs) I do I believe in the power of positivity I believe in uh, neuroscience and the ability to rewire your brain and change your thinking so I I definitely practice the fact that thoughts have the, uh, the power to change your reality. And so when I am in a dark place and I have been in that place many times in my life, I have always um, been given a tool that will help me change to cause a shift in order for me to, to get out of it. Um, and over the years, what I have found is reaching out for support is incredibly important. Mm-hmm. Talking about what's going on, not holding it in, relying on other veterans and people that can understand what you're going through is incredibly important. And personally, I firmly believe in journaling. Meditation has been incredibly, incredibly helpful for me. Yoga. Mm -hmm. Um, I like really holistic things like that, going out into nature, a service animal, I have two, (laughs) Um, can be really helpful in just surrounding yourself with good, positive people who are really supportive and who want to see you succeed. And also believing that, that in hope, believing that you can choose to create your life, you can change it, you can always shift, you can always make a change. There's a lot of power in choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I know that's going to be helpful for a lot of people, veteran or not, Mm -hmm. to to listen to that. So, um, so on your podcast, you're interviewing people who are mostly veterans, mostly women, but sometimes men. Yes. To find out their experiences. And is there anything as you've been interviewing people that has surprised you? Like, 
something they said or an aha moment or something that just was like, oh, I never thought of that. Oh, I didn't know people experienced that. Well, actually, yes, it happens all the time. And in fact, <laughs> in fact, my, um, my episodes end with each of my guests giving some advice. And often the vi- advice is incredible. Um, and that is probably one of my favorite parts of the whole show because we end on such a positive note. But something really interesting happened yesterday. I had the distinct privilege of interviewing um, Jennifer Marshall, who is a, a celebrity. She's an actress in Hollywood and she is incredible. She's an incredible human being and she's also a veteran. She was in Stranger Things. Um, she was on NCIS a couple weeks ago and uh, she is currently the host of Decoded on the CW network. And she, is amazing. So what she said to me yesterday was that as a veteran working in Hollywood, you you would be surprised that people presume your your po- political preferences as a veteran and so may treat you differently. And I was shocked. I was like, I mean, after the fact, I could I could see it, but I'm like, why would you just presume a veteran would be a conservative or a liberal, like what, what does their political background have to do with whether they can perform the role? Mm -hmm. So it just was interesting to me to see that she has to constantly combat a stereotype within her industry, but about a veteran. And I remember there was a time before 9-11 where I had to remove my military training off of my resume because I could not get a job because of it. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Isn't it? I can't help to react it's so to that. terrible. <laughs> that is terrible. You have to take that off. Mm-hmm. Wow. wow. So um, what gives you the most joy and happiness in your life? Oh, so many things. But I think the fact that I know that happiness comes from within and that I, I just embody that. Like, I just feel like life is meant to feel good. So that gives me so much joy to begin with that I always align with things that make me feel good. And so I can remain happy. And I know that I'm not in alignment with what my soul wants or what I really truly want in life. If I don't feel good, if I feel negative or angry or sad, then I know that I need to check what's going on. And then I can get my journal out and write my feelings down or take a walk in the woods or do something, talk to a friend and I can get back in alignment and find that joy. But externally, my family, my kids, you know, um, just getting exercise and being with my friends and having fun. That gives me so much joy and podcasting. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And I know you're starting a new podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, besides the one you're already doing with a group of women, do you want to talk about that? I'd love to. It's called Open Books, Open Minds. And it is going to be sort of a book club. And we are reading Dr. Joe Dispenza, uh, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself for our first book. And we're each going to read a part, maybe a chapter, and we're going to discuss it. So it's kind of a two-part thing. And actually, we're going to live stream one day, and then we're going to have a a discussion another day of the week, and it'll also come as a podcast. So that starts, I believe it launches on the 15th of November. Okay, so will that be on iTunes, or where will people find it? Well, in podcast form, you'll find it on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, Public Radio, Google uh, Podcast, like all the eight platforms, Um, and then on Facebook it'll stream. Okay. So it'll stream on Facebook. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. And and speaking of books, I had read in your bio that you are writing your first novel. I'm trying to. You want to give us a sneak peek (laughs) or is it a secret or? (laughs) It is, it is not, but what I can 
tell you is this. It is based on my military experience, and it is the tale of a young girl of color who is coming of age, so to speak, in the military during the mid-90s, and everything that she experiences to wake up and become woke, if you will, Mm -hmm. and also try to survive that life of being in the military where she doesn't really fit because she's kind of a hippie. Uh. (laughs) She has to to like, (laughs) she has to, she has to figure out how to navigate that and all that comes along with it. So just starting out in life. (laughs) It sounds like a lot of fun. So can't wait to, you know, when you have it out. So yeah, it's a work in progress. I've actually been working on it for three years and I, I have about um, three, three or four chapters left and it'll be done, but I free wrote the whole thing. So then it's going to have to go through massive editing and all of that. And I hope that it'll be out before the end of next year. Okay. Awesome. So um, has there been a time in your personal life when you've had an aha moment? Oh my gosh, many, many, many times, but I will tell you one, I was given Uh, Ernest Holmes, The Science of the Mind, during a really low point in my life, actually during that period where I was nearly homeless and all of that, um, I was, I went to counseling and with this reverend who uh, was an amazing woman and she gave me this book. And as I I read the book, it was really kind of hard to read because it was written so long ago. Mm -hmm. And I read probably each page like 10 times until it would sink in and I could get the meaning. And so the aha moment occurred when I realized that through the power of your mind, you can create your own perfect life just by your thoughts. It was the most incredible, amazing thing I had ever heard in my life. And probably next um, followed up with you become what you think about. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Mm -hmm. So true. So, and, um, I wanted to ask you too, um, about, you had talked about, um, you know, veterans and being, you know, a lot of them being homeless. Is there a way Mm -hmm. that people can actually help with that or give donations or something to your foundation? I mean, how do, how do people who want to help, help? Well, I'm very glad you asked that. That answer is twofold. Uh, The first thing you could do if you want to help me directly and getting Artemisia up and running and thriving is you can go to www.thefemaleveteranspodcast.com and click on the donate button and you can donate there and that will help me get everything going. It'll take you to my GoFundMe page and then you can see what's going on there. Otherwise, and equally as important, if not more so, is to go to your vet center and donate, donate women's items for these women. If you want to do something immediately, they need boots, all different sizes. They need sweatsuits because that's good for winter. Um, maybe a backpack so that they can store their items. Even something as simple as deodorant or toothbrush and toothpaste, a lip gloss, a designer imposter's perfume so that they can just feel like a woman. Because sometimes um, when you're on the streets, a lip gloss and a little perfume and some baby wipes can actually get you to want to get off the streets, (laughs) you know, to make you feel human again enough to want to change your life. And so I say just go and donate, donate at your VA hospital, find your favorite veterans charity, donate there. But the easiest and most simple thing to do is I say go to the dollar store and make a care package and drop it off at the vet center. Mm-hmm. Simple and easy. Awesome. That is awesome. So um, any last words on your best advice for creating an incredible life for yourself? one that's fulfilling, happy, extraordinary? Uh, My advice would be know what you want. Imagine it. Don't put any limit on it. Just lie there in your bed or sit down somewhere and look inside yourself and really think about if you could have anything in the world you wanted, what would that look like? 
and then visualize it and focus on that and feel the emotion of actually having that. And then once you know fully what you want, start taking action towards it because you create your own perfect life. The power is yours through your ability to choose it and you will make a shift and your whole life can change. You just have to put the work in. Thank you so much. And thank you for what you're doing for women veterans across the country. And it's so necessary. And after speaking to you, I know it's so necessary. <laughs> I understand more what the needs are and, and what's really happening. And thank you so much for, for everything you're doing and for, you know, standing up and becoming a voice for these women. I just so appreciate you. And I appreciate you being on the podcast today. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. I really appreciate you allowing me to come on here and talk about it and just giving me a place to spread the word. It's, it's a beautiful thing to have these kind of connections and I appreciate you so much. Thank you.